Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. We hope your gardening projects are off to a great start. And if you've got questions, we've got the answers. Give us a call at 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. Emails and pictures go to byf at unl.edu. We do answer those on a future show. Attach those pictures as JPEGs, and please tell us as much as you can about your question, including at least the county in which you live. Don't forget to follow Backyard Farmer during the week on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. To start our program, let's look at some samples. And Jim Kalish, you have something kicking and something not. Yeah, this is a real succinct show and tell. I have here what's called a polyphemus moth, and it's one of our largest moths that we have in Nebraska. And right now they're flying around and mating and laying eggs, and they have two generations per year. See how it has that wing pattern that looks like it could be like an owl if you look at it the right way? And that's one of its frightening kinds of defenses that it, that it flashes its wings so it kind of looks like an owl. This happens to be a male. Uh, it has real large feathery antennae for finding the female. So they have all the, the hard work they got to do to find a female in order to mate with them. Isn't that cool how feathery that is? And then normally here's a, a cocoon where the, uh, the uh, moth would come out, all right? Um, so this one came out of this cocoon. It squeezed out. The second one, of course, is... Would you like to put that in there? Well, the poor thing. Yeah. I want you to let go of it. And this is what the pupa looks like inside. So it, this one's still at home and hasn't come out yet. But see, there's the pupa inside. And it has its oh, yeah. cast larval skin. And a couple of days, it'll probably come out. And it'll have an easy way to do it because I already have an opening for it. So anyway, and then this is what the caterpillars look like. So they're really beautiful. If you see these on any kinds of trees, lots of deciduous trees, you know, maples and oaks and birches, you know, don't pick them off and destroy them. They're, they're beautiful. They turn into beautiful moths. They don't really cause any damage whatsoever. So they're part of, as Fred would say, part of nature's wondrous pageantry. So remember that. Awesome. The yeah, thank thing. you. Look at it quiver. I know. It, it's it's it. going to wait till it's dark, and then it's really going to fly. OK. All right, Dennis, you're up. You know. I get dozens of calls about moles, rodents, pocket gophers, and there's one control method that is the most efficient at taking care of these in our landscape, and that's the native bull snake. <laughs> it is the largest species in the state, even though its teeth are only a sixteenth of an inch, and that's all they are, so when they hiss at you and have their mouth open, that's all bluff. But this snake grows easily a couple of feet bigger than any other snake in the state. Mm -hmm. And it, it just loves moles. It goes after the moles. It's the only snake in the state that has an extra pointed nose. Here, show the pointed People, nose. Yeah, there right there for digging after moles and gophers. And it doesn't like Lawrence, but it loves <laughs> moles and gophers. And all the nights, Dennis. I, I'm on different times, and we have to always be on when you well, have a snake. That, that's Why? purposely done. <laughs> they will get up to eight foot, which is two foot longer than any other species in the state. They won't eat rattlesnakes. They just outcompete rattlesnakes. So when they're in an area, the rattlesnakes pack up and leave. So again, bull snake, no germs and viruses transmittable to people. We swabbed hundreds of these across the state to show that. And that's all our data. And no, they even, they don't get fleas and ticks that are transmittable yeah. to people either. Nothing to I say. really worry if snakes get fleas and ticks. <laughs> I know, don't we? I do, all the time. They have their own fleas and ticks. Dennis, I thought bull snakes were, were always great. dark. Kind no, they can, they can be almost any color. Really? Yeah, um, color is more genetics. Like my hair is a different color than yours, because uh -huh. I'm older. Um, <laughs> but no, so huh. we don't really go by color. Um, we go by pattern and scalation. So, and. Interesting. Yeah, and bull snakes do have a terminal scale. Doesn't mean they're related to rattlesnakes, but they always have a little button on the end. That just means they're a gopher snake, which means they go after gophers. That is a beautiful creature. Isn't it? Lauren, are you speechless, or can you go ahead? I'm with just speechless sample? how beautiful that creature is. We'll, yeah, put her back, yeah. we'll put it back to sleep. <laughs> Won't sleep the nights. So anyway, that's great. All right, you're up with something that is not moving. Well, it's a little different. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so we've talked about uh, cedar apple rust a few times, and um, this time I just wanted to show you, we've talked about the galls on the cedar tree, and now on the apple side, these are going to release the spores. And these are spent, and then they're going to produce these little spots on the apple tree. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you were wondering about controlling cedar apple rust on the apple tree, 
it's too late. Too late. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's already happened and you're not gonna get reach back. So your next action would be when the undersides of these leaves start to swell up, you'll get spores released here and then those will go back to the juniper. And then next year, oh, let me, sorry to get this where you got. So we're kind of looking on the underside. You can kind of see those little bumps on there. But then next year, you'll have the cedar apple rust galls on the juniper. So it's timing's everything. So you could, you could spray the juniper here in another week probably. Somewhere in that zone is gonna be the time you're gonna have spore release and you could control it there. Or you gotta do it earlier on the apple. So cedar apple rust. And, and, what, and is the, what is the spray? that people should use? Well, there's different ones, and it's gonna depend on what you're, you're doing. If you're in non-fruit producing years on apple trees, um, you know, you can get by with, with some things that you can't use when you're producing fruit. So propiconazole, for example, is an active ingredient um, that would work. If you're, if you're on the fruit producing side and, and maybe you're further north and you don't have this occurring yet, <clears throat> you can use a fruit tree spray. It would have some more contact fungicides. You're gonna work in that seven to 10 day window, but we give you some control that would have some things in it. Uh, on the juniper side, you got a lot more flexibility. You can use some things that are systemic, long residual products that would be easier than nice. the fruiting tree. Awesome, so. thanks yeah. Lauren. Yep. Sarah, beautiful yep. native tree. Yeah, so I wanted to talk tonight, Kim, a little bit about uh, the planting season and, and how much longer people still have to plant. I think we kind of get it in our minds that the planting season in spring goes from Mother's Day to Memorial Day, which of course we're coming up on, but actually, one of the great benefits that containerized plants have provided us is, is the ability to plant longer into the spring season. So you can plant even into uh, about June 30th, as long as we don't suddenly jump into a very hot period of 90, 90 plus degree weather, as long as the temperatures stay fairly moderate, we still have a, another month when you could be planting things like this beautiful catalpa that you see here. And um, I wanted to mention that you know, we're really trying to get people to start planting trees, uh, maybe in anticipation of losing some trees to emerald ash borer, but just because, um, you know, trees provide us so many great benefits, and we've lost, uh, the Forest Service says, about 50% of our tree canopy in the last um, 10 to 15 years. So I um, wanted to point out these publications from the Nebraska Forest Service. If you're looking for some suggestions on trees to plant in your landscape, you can find these on the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum website. We've got trees for Eastern Nebraska, tree recommendations for Western Nebraska, and then we also have a list specifically of uh, trees to replace ash trees in your landscape. So if you're needing some ideas on things to plant, um, go ahead and visit the Arboretum's website and you can find these publications. And uh, you know, a great uh, option would be a catalpa, like this beautiful one. A lot of people don't look really closely to, at the flowers when they're blooming. They remind me of little orchids. And um, catalpa is a great tree to have in a landscape. All right. You know, it's also, an, it's also an indicator for when bagworms hatch. For when, when bagworms bloom. hatch. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. There we go. Part of that landscape system. Yeah. Okay, Jim, you, you get, uh, speaking of bagworms. Mm. Oh, really? You get two pictures sent by two different viewers that you've told me are now two different things. But the first one is this one, and then one of them said, is it a bagworm moth? Yeah, um, no, it's not really. It's a sphinx moth or hawk moth, and it's called a small-eyed sphinx. And believe it or not, it, it tends to rest in that kind of a contorted position where it doesn't look like it's interesting to any kind of a predator. But it feeds on a number of different plants that would be like uh, service berry and cherry and kind of those in that group of, of trees and shrubs. So. Uh, a beautiful, once it flies and everything like that, it looks beautiful, but in there, in there it kind of looks like it's smooshed and hopeless. And what about this? And then this one is actually, the only way I can tell that one is from the eye spot and the, the tan coloration, and that is a, that's a polyphemus moth that didn't quite make it. I mean, they, when they come out and they're still very moist in their bodies and the wings are still moist, they have just a certain amount of time to pump up their wings, and if somehow that's disrupted, then they'll never pump them up again, and so they they just fail. They're gonna be like bird food or something like that. All right, thanks, Jim. I thought that first one looked like a bat. Oh, it looks kind strange, of. doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. All right, Dennis, yes. uh, this is from Rural Ashland. Okay. And this viewer found a snake locked in the mechanism of her sliding glass uh -huh. door. She thought maybe it was a Garter snake. Nope, that's a ring neck. A ring neck. Full grown ring neck. They don't get bigger than 16 inches long. 
Um, they're very common. Eat ant eggs in small, they love to eat small spiders too. They grab the spiders, rub them on the ground to break their legs and swallow them whole. Um, really, they have that color underneath to ward off birds. Their teeth are microscopic. Yeah, it's definitely a ring neck snake. Mm -hmm. And the top color can be any color, and they, the ring on the neck can be anything from red to yellow to white. But they have a small ring in their neck, and the belly is that yellow orangish color. So she's wondering why it would have crawled into her sliding glass. Door. It was probably getting cold, and it, or there might have been ants in there. There might be there might be ant eggs in that wood, um, and they were after a meal. Um, yeah, they should put signs on those doors that the snakes can read. You know, hazardous, <laughs> but you know, doesn't always happen. <laughs> All right. Speaking of, since you love snakes, you know, we had to have snake pictures too, Lauren. Yeah. All right, so your first set of photographs is It's a great night to be here, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> the first is, uh, this is a Blair viewer who has a three-year-old peony. Um, she says this year the buds were blackened as they opened, but the leaves are healthy, and she says it's been a good grower, and there have been some frosts. There's a couple things to make sure I just want to mention as the pictures are going by here to look at the leaves because they are really healthy and that, mm -hmm. that's a strong indication of what I think we're dealing with here to help mm -hmm. identify it. Uh, and with the frost, I, I think it's something where they had some frost on those young uh, buds when they were starting to come out. And, and this possibly. one, on the other hand, from a different viewer is, and they think is this from herbicide drift. That's, yeah. I, Pretty sure that's herbicide drift, the way and, it's looking, where everything's former, curled and deformed like yeah, that. And a former peony. And tomatoes are very sensitive to herbicide drift too. Mm -hmm. So actually I see tomatoes as kind of an indicator plant in the landscape mm -hmm. if you have drift or not. Usually they're the ones that will show up first. Our dog, our, uh, uh, I'm sorry, redbud trees are the other ones that tend to really be sensitive and really uh, have leaf distortion when there's some sort of a growth regulator herbicide. Uh, used and um, I know I've heard Rock say on the show that you know he's more in favor of those fall herbicide applications. That's another good reason right there uh, mm -hmm. because of all those non-target effects. And it's really good to know the difference between what is disease and what is herbicide. Yeah. <clears throat> and then also, there. yeah, especially for our, our tomatoes with viruses, because some of our viral diseases would do that. And you know, you mm -hmm. would rogue that one out for sure if you had a viral disease. But in that case, all the tomatoes will have some sort of leaf distortion as opposed to just one of the tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you only have one tomato plant, you can't really use that. But you know, there may be other indications in the landscape that you got some. All right, thanks, Lauren. Yeah. Um, Sarah, this is an Omaha viewer. White pines got hit by hail, the tops look dead, and I know we've had some other hail events. They're wondering if they should prune those tops off. The rest of the tree looks just fine. I probably wouldn't, because there may be some buds there that you can't really see that are still alive. And if those buds are still alive going into next year, you may be able to get some new growth on there. So um, my, my, uh, inclination would be to wait and, and, and give it another growing season to, to see what happens. Um, if the top is dead next year, then you can certainly prune it out and you can retrain a new leader from one of those side branches that's still alive. But I, I would wait and give it a little bit, uh, give it another season to see if it can recover from this on its own. All right, thank you, Sarah. For our first feature tonight, we'd like to show you ways you can combine your traditional landscape with plants you can eat. An edible landscape can be delicious as well as ornamental. And here to tell us more is Nebraska Extension educator, John Porter. So many people are used to keeping their lawns and landscapes separate from the food that they produce if they are growing fruits and vegetables at home. But there's a concept called edible landscaping that's been around for a few decades that actually sort of blends the line between edible and ornamental. And so you can actually use this principle at home to make your landscape produce food. There's lots of different ways that you can actually go about this. So there are two ways to think of it. We can actually look at the landscape potential of plants that we already produce for food, let's say some berries uh, that we could actually introduce into the landscape. Or you could also think about it the other way and think about landscape plants that you already have in your landscape that actually produce food. So some good examples uh, would be maybe raspberries or blackberries. I have some here behind me. 
and we're used to growing them like this in straight rows sort of off to their, themselves but you could actually incorporate those into the landscape say using them as a hedge uh, in your landscape and actually incorporating them in or you can let them grow free, uh, free flow uh, and actually sort of actually look like a rose so there's lots of different things that we can think about whenever we are uh, incorporating edibles into the landscape so another way to think about it is to actually incorporate things that you already have in your garden into the landscape. So here I have some rhubarb and some asparagus, which on their own don't look like much, but you can actually use asparagus as sort of a, a shield in the garden. You can use it as a backdrop, uh, a backdrop plant that will actually grow out. So this is what mature asparagus looks like. It makes this lovely fern-like plant. And rhubarb is a great perennial that you can add for some foliage in the garden. So another way to think about it is also thinking about those landscape plants that have edible qualities. And some of them you may not think about. So dogwood trees, for example, if you have a dogwood, they produce edible berries that a lot of people like to turn into jams or jellies. They are actually uh, very common. Uh, there's a variety called Cornelian cherry that's very common for jams and jellies. But you can also grow the Korean or Kusa dogwoods that have those big berries that are easy to harvest. You can think about even things like daylilies. So most people don't think about daylilies as edible, but almost the entire plant is edible. You can eat the flowers, the young shoots, and the roots. So you can think about that. Look up some resources. There's lots of great books that will tell you what you can grow, whether it's just common fruits and vegetables that you incorporate into the landscape, or you want to walk on the wild side and add up stuff that is a little bit different. So get out there and play with your food. John had some really good ideas for how you can incorporate something tasty into your ornamental landscape. And as he said, you know, it really just takes some imagination and some good selections to graze on your garden. Okay, Jim, this is a really cool picture and this is from Scott's Bluff. It's a trumpet vine. Uh, they've gotten it to grow really well. <laughs> Too bad for them because it might take over. <laughs> But it has growths on it the size of a ladybug, mm -hmm. shaped like one. They start out tan or brown, and then they turn black. Yeah, I think these are what are called lecanium scales. And this, these are a soft scale. It might be European fruit lecanium because it's so puffy, and at that point it kind of looks like it might be a berry or something that you would eat. But anyway, the scales over winter as, as partly grown uh, nymphs. And then uh, as spring comes, then they fatten up, and they feed on the sap of the trumpet vine. And when they reach adulthood, they lay all these eggs, just thousand eggs underneath each of their bodies. And then those little eggs hatch. And so that's about this time of year when those little hatchlings that will crawl out and all over the trumpet vine up to the leaves and everything like that. So I would say be alert and check right now to see if you can see those tiny little, there's like mite sized uh, nymphs that have hatched. And go ahead and give it a, a, a treatment of insecticidal soap or maybe a spray oil, light spray oil of some kind, just to kill them because they, they were, are very susceptible to that kind of a spray and just keep up the practice a few times. And I think you'll have it under control and you can pick off those uh, adult scales and there's still, some of them still might have eggs in them and then just dispose of them. Awesome, and it'll be interesting to see how well that trumpet vine does in Scott's Bluff. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dennis, you have yep. two pictures. Um, one, is, one is Lincoln, and the other is Oakland. And their questions are, what sort of critters are doing this? Outbuildings, they thought they sealed yeah. up the building. They bring dirt in, oh, well, they build yeah. it up. So, so The first two are one place and this mm -hmm. is another place? This is the second okay, place. Okay, the first two look like a Franklin ground squirrel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a squirrel that looks like our striped ground squirrels, the 13 line, but it's a little fatter and they're becoming more and more evident in the eastern part of the state. And so they can be trapped fairly easily, uh, cage trapped and removed. Or you can pack the holes with uh, road gravel and they'll stop them. Um, the other one, I don't see a hole. When I see tons of dirt like that on concrete and there's just a seam, that's telling me ants. Could be, yeah. I see really? that much dirt from pavement ants. Mm, pavement ants, yeah. Pavement ants, because it's so fine and the fact that it's on concrete and there's no animal that will bring dirt in from outside. Now, if there's a hole behind that blue thing, it could be 
something pushing it up. But if there's just a, 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 real fine. a, a seam, yeah. I would say it's ants bringing that up. Oh, yeah. and, it, and, the, and the pavement ants will make the concrete fall. Mm -hmm. And they've been yeah. swarming lately. Yeah, so. and right now pavement ants, I know in my driveway, they've gotten easily, you know, a drywall bucket full of dirt they've brought up. Oh my heavens. Yeah, and they work fast. So we'll send them a follow-up yeah. comment. Send out a bait or something and see out what what's happens. under that right. yeah. blue bench. Yeah. All right, thanks, Dennis. All right, um, Lauren, this is actually one of our master gardeners and has a yellow buckeye. It's doing really well. It's uh, Lincoln. But he's got this going on, one side and the other, and he thinks it's a rust, and he wonders what he should do about it. Well, in general, um, it is a rust, and uh, all the uh, chestnuts, buckeyes, they mm -hmm. all get, they will get a rust. Um, usually, though, it's just like when we were talking earlier about the cedar apple rust cycle. So that rust is, is not going to repeat and infect the buckeye more. So the cycle is pretty much completed and then that's gonna go over to another host and I'm not exactly sure what that host is for this one. Uh, but again, it's the cycle's over so you won't see repeating, you won't see more infections. So I, I really wouldn't do anything for treatment um, at this point. If it gets to where you know, it's significant, then you know, we might look into host and maybe even some management of that if it's close by. Okay, and we'll so. watch that in the Arboretum in the collection and when it gets really yeah. bad. Yeah, I think we'll some of them pictures. cycle to some of the ornamental grasses. Or, okay. but I can't remember which one. All right. Sarah, this is also a master gardener and has uh, a Schumert oak, two years old, planted professionally, took the stakes off, top leader has had a little bit of a bend after the winds, and this is in Bennington, so north of Omaha, really leaning from west to east on an acreage. The more it grows, the more it seems to bend and, and she's wondering how to straighten that leader or should she? So I'm wondering if she's concerned about the upper part of the central leader or if she's looking at that trunk, the lower part of that trunk and wanting to straighten that. And there really isn't a good way to do that. And I wouldn't recommend staking a tree into an upright position and trying to force that trunk to be straight because it's not really gonna do that. It's not gonna really straighten out uh, and, and become, you know, totally vertical. I guess the other underlying question in my mind, too, is if this tree has established well and if it's firm in the ground, and you can go, you can check that real easily by just going up and taking a hold of the trunk and seeing if you can move it. And if you can move the base of the trunk at the soil line, then the tree hasn't established well. And it could certainly, the wind could certainly blow it over then if we, if we have really high winds. So I guess what I would do, Kim, is I, I wouldn't worry about that lower part of the trunk and trying to straighten that. I would look at the upper branches and I would, I would try to prune the upper part of that central leader so that you're always going to a shoot that is going as, as vertical as possible. Now, it's probably not ever going to be 100% straight, but, it, but that's okay. That doesn't bother the tree. It, it may be a problem for you because you really want it to be straight. But prune it to the most upright growing shoot and, um, and, and then just let it develop from there. It looked like it had a big uh, branch that was going off to one side uh, that could potentially develop into a co-dominant leader. I would head that back and then I would look at, you know, maintaining that central leader. All right, good advice, thanks, Sarah. Well, last week we got the majority of our backyard farmer garden planted as we dodged those rain clouds. We're also trying something new in our containers. So here to tell us more about the Backyard Farmer Garden this week is Extension Educator, Terry James. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're gonna talk about what we have planted. Last week, remember, we talked about how we were dodging all the showers with the Master Gardeners getting everything planted. Well, it's all pretty much planted except for a few things that we still have to hand sew in a couple spots. But we're gonna look at what we planted. We're gonna look at specifically this week in our containers. We actually did a special planting of containers that are all edible vegetables. You can grow vegetables in your backyard, on your deck, or even in your apartment. In our edible containers, we have some small tomatoes. They're only gonna to get to be about 15 inches tall. We have some broccoli, some cabbage, we have some green beans, we have some Swiss chard, and we also have some nasturtiums. Those nasturtiums are an edible flower. You can pick those flowers, add them to your garden salad, 
for a great burst of color, or it'll add that color to that container. So check out the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out our edible containers. Try as it was, it didn't look like it. You know, we're off to another great start this year, and we hope that all that early moisture pays off in the weeks to come and that we don't turn off that faucet for good over the summer because it sure helps the master gardeners sure when they don't has. have to drag hoses. All right, Jim, this is, a, this is an Omaha viewer. The tips on burning bush are curling up and appears to be some kind of an insect causing this inside. Um, they've never had it before. How to fix it? Will it kill the plant? And he is describing it as being similar to what happens with honeysuckle. Okay, yeah, I'm, th I'm thinking there's, uh, we have uh, viburnum and euonymus serve as winter hosts for what are called black bean aphids. Mm. And they have a, you know, that's their winter host. So in the springtime, as you see the leaves form or just unfolding and forming, if the, the aphids are there, they're uh, removing s some of that sap and all that growth, the strength in those little ends of growth. And so you're gonna get some distortion and some curling of the leaves. And uh, then, about this time of year, then they move on to their other hosts, which could be a, a wide array of herbaceous garden plants and other kinds of plants and even weeds in the landscape. So they, they're notorious for having a wide host range in the summer. But so that's my guess. And so we're past that point. And it really isn't deleterious to the, the shrub anyway. It's not com usually not completely uniform all over and causing any kinds of issues. And um, you know, it kind of serves as a bar for little ants to come by and lap up the honeydew that they secrete, <laughs> or maybe some of them that are predaceous and they feed on them, little feeding stations. So just enjoy it as it is, I think, unless it's really, really bad. All right, thanks, Jim, little, little lapping station, okay. <laughs> All right, from Springfield, Dennis, uh, right. squirrels are getting into this caller's potted plants. Can she put anything on the <clears throat> soil? to keep the squirrels away, and, and our, um, our phone panel said put a wire mesh around them. Right, and that's the best thing to put over. So things like mothballs or sprays are not going to do any good, and they're not the best to have out there for the soil or for anything else. So if you get something, a mesh, especially if you can put it down before the plants start getting too high, like a chicken wire and the plants come up between it, um, once they hit their wire, they'll stop digging. So if you can put some you know, wire in there, maybe even an inch diameter wire, it, the holes are inch in diameter, it would stop the squirrels from digging in that pot. Okay, you know, I've put pine cones in mine too. And if That's they're not how, hungry, but, they're not gonna eat. But they also eat pine cones. Right. So right. they can just take them and if you're gonna do that, you might as well use shelled corn. No, they actually eat my house instead of the pine cones. So yeah. they're marking your house. Tastier. That's graffiti. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we, it's a bad neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty vulgar. The squirrels. Yeah. yeah. Should borrow a snake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could do I'd that. Do I'm not afraid of them. Borrow a snake. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, Lauren. Uh, <laughs> we do not have a picture for this one, but this viewer says she has brown spots on her tomato leaves, and they're planted with five gallon pails around them. Okay. So without a photograph, we don't know where she's from either. Yeah, that's, actually. that's really kind of a hard one. So, um, yeah. I mean, it, it could be a, a range of things. So I, I, I almost hate to say, I, I'm gonna just make a brief statement about general disease management though. So, you know, if there are a lot of foliar diseases of tomatoes, this is really early if you're in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, having some mulch down, avoiding overhead irrigation, those will all be things that will really help you um, as you go through the season with your tomatoes. All right. Sarah, this is a Mitchell viewer, and um, we've had this question before. It's, it's a really interesting one from other parts of the state. Their iris are changing color. So they're saying that they were deep burgundy one year and now they're purple. Is that reversion? Is that be. oops? What, what do be. we have here? Some plants do tend to to have mutations that it can occur um, in, uh, in various plant parts, and then you can see uh, a different type of growth coming up. Spirea is one of the plants that leaps to mind that we see reversions, and you'll get white foliage and things like that from that. So, I mean, it, it could be something like that, or maybe this was a hybrid type of, of iris, and then you got um, a sport coming off that was more the original parent type of growth. And oftentimes that, that reversion or that revision um, is going to be more vigorous, and so it will overgrow the hybrid portion of the plant. 
So if you're not getting any burgundy flowers anymore, then you may have lost that part of the plant. And so if you didn't want, if you don't want the, the plant that you have, you're probably just gonna have to dig it up and get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that on the pure white one that kind mm -hmm. of goes back to a yeah. sort of a yellowy thing. If you catch it in that stage where you have the original color and the, and the, rever and the uh, new color, and you can cut off the rhizome section where the new color is occurring and just keep the original color, then you're better off and you might be able to maintain that, that hybrid in your garden. We'll start the lightning round. Are you ready, Sarah? I am ready. We have an Omaha viewer whose hosta environment has changed, turning her hostas into lace in full sun, wondering if the lace is the problem and should she move the one that looks good that's remaining? The full sun is probably more of an issue. I mean, you may have slugs that are feeding on the leaves, but your hostas are gonna do better in the shade. All right, so move it now. Yeah. We have a Council Bluffs viewer that has a dwarf wagyoya, but it has two huge canes coming out, out of it and the flowers are a different color. What's that all about? That goes back to that reversion question we just talked about a minute ago, cut those out. Okay, can you use grass be gone on asparagus beds? Uh, I don't believe it's labeled for asparagus, so no. All right, and not salt. No, definitely not salt. <laughs> there is a viewer who has a hibiscus house plant. Um, there's a white residue on the soil and the leaves are yellowing. No picture. Um, that could just be built up fertilizer salt in the soil. You might wanna flush the soil by, by pouring a lot of water and just letting it drain away and that might help get, get rid of that. I'm not sure if that's related to the yellow leaves or not. All right, if the peony buds are hard and they don't wanna open, what's going on with that? Could be botrytis. We see that quite often in peonies in springtime. All right, nice she job. Is. She's so relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> all right, are you ready, Lauren? He's ready to yeah. run away from all these snakes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, no picture, but we have a, a viewer who has a brownish black gel-like fungus on their white oaks. Most likely uh, like uh, auricularia, possibly on the dead limbs. So uh, different jelly fungi start and form on these dead or, or dying limbs. So that would be my guess on that. All right, uh, we have a COZAD viewer who thinks his tomatoes have rust. Are there rust diseases? Never seen rust on tomatoes. It may occur, but I've never seen it. Okay, a Fort Calhoun viewer uh, wants to be reminded about the window for treating peach leaf curl. Uh, it's too late now. You wanna treat that in the bud stage early on and actually just a dormant spray works really well before bud break. All right. Um, a Fillmore County viewer wants to know whether cedar apple rust can actually kill the cedars in a windbreak. If it got really severe, it's gonna really remove a lot of small branches and, and it can affect the, the crown or the canopy of that overall tree. I, I don't think it would kill it, but you're gonna want it to be dead. <laughs> it's gonna be so ugly or what? Yeah. It's gonna look bad. <laughs> All right, on that note. <laughs> You ready, Dennis? Yeah, as ready as a fungi. Okay, a gel-like <laughs> fungi, fungi, right? All right, this is a, a viewer who has purchased the multi-catch traps. Okay. But one of their mouse trap labels says catch them and then release the mice two miles away. Is that? Well, that's legal because there is no, you know, most fur-burning animals, you can't move more than 100 yards. If you release them, Two miles away, it's going to be a slow, agonizing death, but it's legal to do that with mice. Okay. What would be crawling up the trees at night making a scratching sound? And this is a Hastings viewer. Could be uh, raccoons, probably be the biggest thing that would do that. Okay. A broken bow viewer is wondering, they haven't seen any bats yet? Are they just not looking or aren't they out and about? They're out and about. We've gotten a lot of bat calls. They're there. Okay. Do turtles, besides our snappers, have teeth? No turtles have teeth. They have a tamiya, which some people call a beak. So, so when a snapping turtle gets your finger... It's like a beak. <laughs> a sharp one. Okay, can you predict which years the vole population is going to crash? It changes in every population, so they overlap. You can predict it for each population. Okay, nice wow, job. Good comeback. I tell you what, you guys are getting complicated for the lightning round questions. Yeah. All right, you ready? Yes. 
A Lincoln viewer has seen grasshoppers half an inch long on the grasses already. What can be done about it? Oh, it would be a good idea to make sure that you, you mow some of these areas that you, where you don't want them and in, in the areas where they tend to be. Uh, you can go ahead and treat it, like waste areas, go ahead and treat them with an insecticide to kill them. Okay. There are white flecks, little ones, all over the needles of a Black Hill spruce in the Crofton area. My guess is it's probably spruce spider mites, and we're kind of coming toward the end of the season, but the peak of damage is still yet to be maybe toward the end of June. So I'd give it a good washing down if, if it's possible. Okay. Um, this viewer said it looked like they had snail shells in their garden. Is that possible? Oh, yes, very possible. And all kinds of different species of snails in gardens and landscapes. Okay. Uh, we have a viewer having a graduation party in Lexington, and they want to know about yard control of mosquitoes. Well, that's very difficult. You know, there's, there's pyrethrin-type foggers that can be used to temporarily knock them down. That's probably the safest method to do it, and have somebody who knows what they're doing do that for you. And uh, then, you know, within a, it's, your time is limited for your party, essentially. It's a good way to Several send your hours. guests home. Yes. <laughs> Especially if it's a high school graduation. All right, thanks, guys. Okay, Sarah, plant of the week. Yeah. Um, the Baptisia doesn't want to stand up straight, but, it, <laughs> but that's the way it does. That's all right. Maybe they can see the flowers better that way. Maybe I should move it over here so you can really see them better. Um, so yeah, the, the plant here, the taller plant in the background is Baptisia, or uh, false blue indigo is a common name for this particular plant. This cultivar is called a solar flare prairie blues. And it's kind of unusual in that the flowers open yellow, and then as they age, they turn this darker purple color. So you can see on, on this stem how the flowers are changing to that darker purple color. So typically the Baptisias are gonna be in the blue range. We see flower colors in the dark blue, light blue, or white. So this one is a little bit more unusual with this kind of yellow purplish coloration. The Baptisias are really, really uh, tough plants, uh, very well adapted in Nebraska. Generally, they're gonna grow somewhere in the uh, close to three feet height range, uh, unless you're planting a dwarf type. They love full sun. They get, the, the clump just gets bigger and bigger every year and you'll just have more and more flower stems. Uh, and so they're a really nice plant to add to a, a perennial border. So the, the little roses that we have here in the front are several different types of shrub roses. And shrub roses have really, um, really gained in popularity over the last, uh, well, probably 10 to 15 years, maybe. Um, we've got the Knockout. This is a, just the, the first uh, shrub in the Knockout series that came out, just the plain single Knockout Red. Uh, then there's also a double Knockout Red. Then here, the one in the front, the shorter flowers, we have Champlain. Mm. Um, there's some good series of rose, shrub roses to look for. Uh, the Knockout series is a great one. The Explorer series, which includes the Champlain, were all after, named after famous explorers. Uh, and then there's also the Buck Roses, the Buck series uh, that was developed in Iowa. But the, the shrub roses are all, they, they provide some great benefits in that they've been chosen because they're very tough, they're hardy, they're disease resistant. Um, they don't need a lot of special care like some of our hybrid teas do in the garden. And so they tend to be pretty trouble free. Uh, and easier to grow. So, you know, definitely look for shrub roses in the Knockout, the Explorer, or the Buck Rose series if you're thinking about adding some roses to your garden. Excellent, thanks, Sarah. All right, pictures next, Jim. And speaking of aphids, uh, we have two different viewers that send us pictures of maples. This is an Oregon Trails maple, mm -hmm. Johnson County. The second one is actually a Coin, Iowa viewer, and that is uh, east of the Nebraska-Iowa border, east of Nebraska yeah. City. Mm -hmm. And then we threw in a handful <coughs> of others that are uh, perhaps on campus that yeah. maybe Jody and Jonathan might be talking about next week, but what, oh, okay. what do we have going on with maples All right. here? Well, there's, there's a couple, there's that uh, black bean aphid again mm -hmm. in Euronymous, but. Well, you had before on the maple, um, I noticed there's been a lot of people complaining about the, the maples having uh, the edges curled or cup, cupping going on. And aphids can be responsible, but I don't think that explains the, the, all, the total problem. Um, 
as they withdraw the sap and everything, that the leaf will cup a little and is, as it's expanding too, so that's a little bit depressed. And so I can see what looks like the pale green in that image look like maple aphids. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can really cause a lot of that sticky honeydew and then you can get uh, powder, not, not powdery, what's that mildewy stuff? Uh, sooty, sooty. Sooty. Sooty, mold. sooty mold or whatever on there as well. But uh, <coughs> that generalized cupping there looks like it's some, it's just too uniform to be aphids. Because aphids you're gonna find on certain portions of trees. And by the way, those other aphids are happen to be uh, woolly aphids mm -hmm. that were shown in that other image. And those are alder, maple alder aphids. And eventually they'll sprout, all sprout wings and then they'll fly off to the alder. <laughs> and uh, the maple will have a break then after mm -hmm. that. But none of this is deleterious. Um, you know, once in a while a leaf will get yellow, that kind of thing, but not, not to the tree itself. As far as explaining the uniform cupping, I suppose maybe Sarah's fielded a lot of calls regarding that. Well, you know, that. I would look for, um, again, herbicide damage, which mm -hmm. we've seen on a lot of samples. And spring is a time when a lot of uh, weed spring is going on, so it could be herbicide drift. Um, sometimes we see some environmental effects that can cause leaf cupping too. So if we didn't see the typical uh, veining patterns that we see with uh, you know, 2,4-D and dicamba, it could be environmental too. Yeah, hard yeah. to tell with maples. Yeah. We're not really maple country. All right, Critter. This mm -hmm. is uh, a viewer who found this frog at one of our box stores. She thinks he hitched a ride on plants from someplace warmer. She wants to identify it and release it in Nebraska if it's not tropical, and if it is, what what does she do with it? Well, it's not native. It's probably, she's probably right, it hitched a ride. It's a, one of the tree frogs, one of the hylas. It looks like one of the ones that may be in Florida in the southeast part of the United States. So either <laughs> bring it back there, um, or keep it as a pet, or euthanize it. Do not let it go. It's not native. Uh, it, it's just going to disrupt everything. Okay. Um, so you, you know, maybe bring it to a pet shop and have them rehome it. All right. Thanks, Dennis. Um, Lauren, this is probably a simple, quick one with not much information, but we have a crab apple um, showing a lot of damage, especially on the trunk. Yeah. And so actually, on this one, there's uh, this. You can kind of see if you look in this a little bit of like some gummy canker appearing material here at the base, those dark areas. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell for sure from the picture, but if the viewer, if, if that is like a gummy material, I think it's probably got a canker towards the lower portion of, the, of that tree. So um, I think it's definitely something you have to replace. There's nothing you can do about it. The suckers that come up, I guess you could, but it may be coming up. Do they ever, they graft Over. those sometimes, yep. so yep. you might not have what you're looking at yep. or wanting. So I think I would remove the whole thing and start over. All right, thanks. Speaking of cankers, Sarah, fine line buckthorn, green foliage at the top only. She wonders if the shrub is worth saving or not. Probably not, because um, uh, what's going to happen is that that lower part of the tree where the, the branches have died or the leaves have turned brown is not going to relief again. It's going to stay, you know, looking just the way you see it in that picture. You know, th this could be some kind of a, of a fungal leaf problem or it could be a canker uh, of some type. Uh, the buckthorns are prone to some cankers. Um, so, you know, given the way that it looks, it's probably be better to take it out and start over. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Well, Memorial Day is a day for us to remember those who sacrificed for our freedoms. One tradition that has been observed since the First World War is wearing red poppies. And just outside the backyard farmer garden, we have a bed of poppies we'd like to show you. As we celebrate 65 years of Backyard Farmer, we're also looking at some of the plants that might even be older than that. And one of those is regular old poppy. This is the oriental poppy, the straight species. Our guess is this has been here as long as this big old oak tree. And you talk about a plant that is hardy as a box of rocks, this is one of them. The thing about poppies is that they are plants that love the sun, they like really good drainage, the foliage comes out of the ground in the early spring, and then they're supposed to bloom around Memorial Day. You're probably well aware of the Memorial Day poppies for veterans. 
but depending on the season and mother nature, they may bloom as early as May. They may bloom a little bit later into the middle of June. What we're looking at is these beautiful single stems without leaves, a fuzzy bud that breaks open, and these beautiful papery petals that flutter in the wind and fall off in the wind. So, of course, poppies really don't last very long. You have to enjoy the show when you can get it. And then they have very interesting seed heads. A lot of poppies that are available now commercially are very complex hybrids. And what has happened is they have bred into those poppies much larger foliage, great big clumps of foliage, and flowers that are really spectacular. They still have those papery petals, but they come in colors that range from a pure white to a double deep, deep, almost a blackish plum color. Watermelon is actually the name of one of the poppies. And most of them have a beautiful blotch, a black blotch in the center that really accentuates the color. One of the things about poppies, however, is that they are not the easiest things in the world to get in the ground and get to bloom. So, typically poppies are not widely available in these tiny small sizes in 32s. A plant like this may take three to four years to flower. Oftentimes what you find for the hybrids will be a gallon size or a number one, a plant like this. And even this one has not set a bud for this bloom season. So it may be a year, it may be two years in the ground before this poppy flowers. One of the issues with planting poppies is that they absolutely detest having their roots disturbed. So a trick is in the greenhouse, they don't like the humidity very well. They don't like fluctuations in the temperature. They like it hot, they like it drier. But if you try, if you buy one and take it out, the best thing you can do is make sure that when you're pulling that plant out of the container, you're very, very careful not to damage the roots. You can also buy poppies bare root and you can buy poppies from seed. You can, you can actually start oriental poppies from seed. Many of the annual poppies provide beautiful color for a very short season, of course, because they're poppies. And some of those, like the Icelandic poppy, actually like it a little bit cooler. The seeds of all poppies are edible, but the bread poppy is the one from which the, the poppy seeds that you make, poppy seed bread, come from. As we go into 2018, we're going to be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Veterans Administration and talking about the Flanders field poppy and looking at all the beautiful poppies that Nebraskans have planted or come to love at their old farmsteads in their cemeteries and around their homes. You know, unfortunately, our poppies have faded, but our thoughts really go out to all the veterans and those still defending our freedom all over the globe. All right, so picture four. This is a, a, spot, a potted Dracaena. This is a Mondamon, Iowa viewer. Has these insects scampering out of the soil each time they water. Yeah, so that's a centipede. It's called a so stone centipede, lithobius species, lithos, stone, stone centipede. And so it's a good, good uh, arthropod down there at the base of the plant and in the soil because they'll be eating anything that might might be harmful to the plant itself, so let it do its job and even reproduce. All right, it's not gonna get into their And it's walls. not poisonous or anything <laughs> like that when it bites. So. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Dennis, yeah. uh, this is a papillion viewer, sent us this picture and wonders what the critter is. Okay, I can't see its teeth, but by the tail and the claws, I see a dead squirrel, okay. a baby squirrel, like two or three days old. Okay, so something plucked it and, out of its... Yeah, well, or it might have fell with the wind yeah. uh, from the leaf nest, because this is the time of year they're having their second litter mm -hmm. right now. Okay. And so it, it, there's probably four or five in the litter and the wind knocked it out. Okay, all righty. Lauren, it's a rhubarb year, and we have a viewer who says it's not doing well, hasn't been doing well since the drought, yellowing, shriveling, and I know you had a sample in the uh, lab. A couple different things. So rhubarb, as, the, as it ages, it will get some crown and root rots, and particularly, uh, you know, a drought year, if you didn't supplemental water that plant uh, and keep it really healthy, that also would favor some injury because the plant would be stressed. So I'm thinking it's probably a crown and root rot. Uh, recently, we did have a bacterial crown and root rot 
identified in the, the diagnostic lab um, by Kyle Broderick, and that was one that's different that we haven't seen a lot of, but uh, any of these diseases like that as the stand gets older, so you would really want to, if you want to refresh it, remove the plants and, and probably start over would be the safest route. All right, thank you, Lauren. Sarah, this is an idea of a shrub, and uh, this viewer wants to know whether people can eat it and or can his chickens eat the berries? So this is a honeysuckle, uh, Lonicera uh, is the genus. And uh, no, honeysuckle is not edible by humans and mammals. It doesn't seem to bother birds though. And I did check the ASPCA website. They do not list honeysuckle as a toxic plant for um, dogs and cats, but it shouldn't be a problem for chickens. So you can let them eat it if you want. <laughs> they do tend to, um, honeysuckle can be a little invasive, uh, especially the Tartarian type though. So uh, it, usually it's not a problem in Nebraska. That's more East Coast, but just keep that in mind too. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, we have a pile of announcements of fun things going on in the gardening world this week. The first is the Monument Valley Iris Society show in Scotts Bluff at Panhandle Research and Extension Center. The second one is also uh, produce from the heart, which is donating your extra produce every Tuesday through September, starting in June in the Backyard Farmer Garden. We're looking forward to that, and that'll be a lot of fun. Our next announcement is we will be on location Saturday, June 17th at 10 a.m. at the Ed Weir Track, northeast of Memorial Stadium. That will be a lot of fun. Look, we'll look forward to giving you more information about that one. All right, Dennis, you, you just had to do that to poor Lauren. Yep, one more time. <laughs> All right, you just hold right sure on to it. This is the one that climbed across my lap a couple of years ago. Well, we go to questions, and yeah. Jim, let's see. Let's Great, give Dennis. you a so happy to Japanese beetle grub question. Wants to know when to apply the grub control for Japanese well, you can, beetles. You can apply it just about any time. I see probably. A better time would be as we get into about mid-June because the weather hasn't been that conducive, and uh, so then get it on at that time, and then it'll be it'll be just fine. Make sure you get it with a little bit of watering going on, and that will be there. It's imidacloprid or uh, chlorantranilaprol, or the two um, the chemistries that are used, and so they're long-lived and they need to be put in now, and then uh, that will intercept the grubs as they hatch, and then of course kill them. Perfect. You know that feeling if you've got a children that like to ride the roller coaster and you don't like to ride the roller coaster, but you get on it anyway and you just kind of sit there the whole time going like this? Mm. We're there. You notice how our panel actually can keep their focus and answer yeah. questions while we have movement on the table. That's great. Lost so, Dennis. <laughs> yes. Syracuse, how do you keep uh, squirrels out of the apple trees so they don't eat the apples? Right here. Um, they'll climb trees and take the squirrels. They love squirrels. Um, it's difficult. If you put it, just some netting over the tree and the squirrels and the birds, once they get up in there, they'll feel like they're confined and they'll stop that. So just a kind of like what they call bird netting, monophilic netting draped over the tree. All right, perfect. Lauren, to keep your mind off, off the table, we Focus. have a Lincoln viewer with a dark red clematis. One of them is wilting sort of in the middle and it's not all the stems. The others are going like gangsters. Um, Clematis does get a, a, a fungal wilt actually. So I, I would watch that. Uh, if, but if a lot of the stems are doing fine, it, there may just be something on that. Usually the whole bush would wilt or, or be stunted to some degree. So I, I would just watch that one and, um, and see uh, what happens. But, but just recognize you could have a, a root rot. And he's drinking the coffee now. The <laughs> <laughs> just the water. Just the water. <laughs> see, go ahead, give it some of my coffee. No, I don't like coffee. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> Sarah, we have time for one quick question. This is from Bloomington. Uh, garden plants died, and this is another uh, second year. The soil test showed phosphorus over 200. Used ash from the stove, which pushed it higher. Any we ideas? normally have very high phosphorus content in our soil, and so I don't think that that 200 count is going to be a toxic level. In fact, phosphorus doesn't really reach a toxic level. Um, it could have been salts. I mean, wood ash can sometimes bring a lot of salts in, so that might be more of a concern. All right. Thank you, Sarah.